your friends don't seem like the friends at all when they treat you like you're at their back and call oh. you I'm Jonathan Goldstein, and you're listening to Wiretap on CBC Radio 1 and Sirius Satellite Radio 159. Today's episode, Man vs. Machine, in which an astronaut drives a robot to insanity, a tape recorder takes over a man's life, and a group of strangers contemplate the mystery of the northern lights under the Alaskan sky. When they're quick to replace you with an answering machine, John. Sitting you down till you lean it in the oh. oh. Logbook entry number one, April 22nd, 2088, 0700 hours. Day one of the voyage to the Robotics Engineering Convention in Andromeda M6, where I am due to speak. I am making the journey with Clyde X-12 of the trusty companion third-generation Android series. Clyde and I will be traveling three months, one week, and four days and I've been tasked by the Council with keeping this logbook in order to record the effects of long-term intergalactic space travel on an artificially intelligent robot. There is very little documentation on the subject, and as one of the primary engineers of the Trusty Companion series, I am keenly interested in Clyde's performance. Though I must admit that even at this early point in our travels, I'm fearful Clyde may not fare very well. I refer you to minute six of our journey, as recorded by the in-cabin audio archive. What am I supposed to do now with all this sticky mess in my wires? Less than ten minutes into our voyage, I accidentally spilled orange soda onto Clyde's lap. What were you thinking? His reaction skewed towards the negative. I'm sticky and uncomfortable, and my wiring does not respond well to liquid. This is just great. As creator of the series... Clyde's pater omnipotent eterne deus, if you will, his god. This bad temperament is a very hard pill to swallow. I suppose it's not unlike what a parent experiences when his child is having a department store tantrum. You can't help but wonder where you might have gone wrong. Logbook entry number 17, May 7th. 0900 hours. Two weeks into our mission, and we've been grounded. Distracted as I was with making last minute fixes to the on ship space cola fountain, I forgot to pack enough fuel. Luckily, Clyde was able to turn on our backup solar engine, a change of plan that will only delay our trip by an extra two months. I'm impressed by Clyde's sophisticated exemplification of human worry. He's been biting his nails non-stop for the past three hours, and his metallic fingertips are becoming prematurely rusty. Logbook Entry 25 June 12th, 0600 hours Halfway into our voyage and the taste of dehydrated carrots is becoming quite tiresome. As for Clyde, he spends long hours in silence, as though portraying an almost human-like petulance. Nevertheless, I try to engage with him to pass the time, and he remains testy and short-tempered, at times even hysterical, all hallmarks of stage C space madness. I refer you to minute 36042 of the audio archive. Please just let me listen to my book on tape. I just don't feel like making conversation with you. I mean, it's hard to even call it conversation. Blah blah blah. What's the difference between jelly and jam? I don't know. And I don't care. As primary designer of Clyde's operating system, I don't recall having installed complex delusional thinking capabilities, yet it would seem he is developing all the signs of paranoia. Are you actually going to deny it? I can smell it. There are only two of us. And I'm a robot. 
My olfactory receptors registered it quite clearly. I fear Clyde's judgment can no longer be trusted. You seem almost proud of it. Why else would you be smiling? Logbook entry 48. September 4th, 1400 hours. I am sad to report that Clyde's spiral into madness has grown even worse. I'm traveling through space with an imbecile. Your feet smell, and you make noises, like a cat, when you eat. This hysterical outbreak was recorded scalp. after I had merely suggested we enjoy some noodle dancing to the music of Jefferson Starship at a virtual love-in in the holodeck. Do you ever shut up? Seriously? Who needs to hear every stupid thought that pops into your head? I'd rather be traveling through space with one of those Russian space monkeys. Logbook entry number 67, September 8th, 0900 hours. Awaking in the middle of the night, I found Clyde hovering over my bed, a pillow held close to my face. What are you doing, I asked. Why, primping your cushion, he replied. Primping at that hour of the evening. His chronometer certainly needs rejigging. Space has turned Clyde into a most unpredictable machine. Logbook entry number 70. At last we have reached our destination of Andromeda M6. My fellow conventioneers are mildly peeved to have had to wait an additional two months for me to take the dais but they seem otherwise happy to see me. We are also greeted by the robotics team I'd radioed ahead for. With little ado, they were able to subdue Clyde and power him off for good. Please, kill me. Kill me now. Pull the switch. End this nightmare. Now, my tendency and is, of course, to self-chastise, for it would seem in some ways this intolerance for longer-term travel is a shortcoming of the series I've engineered. Yet, if thought of in another way, Clyde's madness can be taken as a triumph, for I have succeeded in creating something so authentic, so faithful to the spiritus humanus, that Clyde embodies man's glory as well as his pitfalls. You see, I have witnessed the ill effects of space madness in almost all of my fellow human travelers, even those I've journeyed with by land automobile for less than a half hour. And it would seem Clyde is no different. What a feat! A robot that is no different than God's greatest creation, mankind. And so even as I offer my recommendation for the discontinuation of the third generation trusty companion series and begin development of the fourth, I cannot help doing so without a trace of pride. End transmission. It would seem, judging from that last story, that man and machine are fated to forever joust. Anyone who's ever tried to program the clock on their oven knows exactly what I'm talking about. But there are times when man and machine can work together, and this next tale is about just that. Here's David Weinberg with the true story of one man's attempt to employ a lifeless machine to help make sense of his life. At 23, I didn't have a lot going for myself. I'd been kicked out of college and was living in Colorado delivering pizzas. But while on the job one day, I heard a story on the car radio. It was about a man who hated his job and quit it to travel the country interviewing strangers with a tape recorder. It was then and there that I decided that was what I wanted to do. Go on adventures and make radio stories about my adventures. So I quit my job and bought a mini disc recorder. The only hitch in this plan was that the idea of actually interviewing people terrified me. 
I would get this ball in the pit of my stomach, and my chest would tighten up at the thought of trying to approach strangers with a mic. I couldn't even work up the courage to interview people I knew. So the solution I came up with was to wear a wire and record in secret. Testing. One, two, testing. It became a part of my morning ritual. After brushing my teeth and getting dressed, I would thread a microphone cable through a hole I'd cut in my pants pocket and clip a tiny mic to the inside of my shirt just above the third button for my collar. My original plan was to wear the wire for a couple weeks and use the tape to make my first story. I didn't know exactly what the story would be, but I had faith that it would come, and I loved recording. Do I have some? I think, is this yours? Do you want to buzz? Yes. This is one of the very first recordings I made. I was on a camping trip with some friends. Only after several beers was I unafraid to tell my friends about the mic. In fact, I went around like a kid with a new toy, showing everyone my recorder and making them put the headphones on. Listen, this is the coolest thing in the world. Put these on. Isn't that cool? It's a live recording of what's happening right now. Right now? Yeah. And so I just kept recording. Week after week, month after month. It became a compulsion, and I couldn't stop. I wore the wire nearly every day for over three years. I made a jester. Who did, who did I make I recorded bar fights in small towns. Speak up! Speak up. Right. Easy. Who's the big Easy. guy? Easy. Speak up! I recorded countless street musicians. Ah, 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 ah. And I went to Alaska and worked on a boat and recorded this guy's reaction to hearing about the Northern Lights for the first time. When they told me that shit, I'm like, what the fuck do you mean the lights be dancing? My first guy here, this and dances, dude. I'm like, oh shit. And the hippie kid who assured him that it was magic by telling him about the time that he kissed a girl under its vortex. So we kiss, and bam, there's the bolt of line, quarter inch. Because we get just close enough, and it would go pow. And we're like, whoa, no way. And we look up, and the lights oh, are still... Look, oh, look, 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 look. After quitting my job as a pizza delivery man, I went to New York, where I started working at a perfume factory in Queens. Every morning, I would get up before dawn, set up my recorder, and take a bus and two trains, then walk half an hour to the factory. Inside the factory were long tables filled with little mountains of perfume samples and small glass vials. Next to each pile were stacks of glossy cardstock with a picture of Britney Spears on them. Lined up on both sides of the table were Haitian women who spent all day clipping the vials to the cards. Their hands moved so quickly it was like watching a movie on Fast Forward. My job was to stand at the end of the table and put the samples into boxes, then put those boxes into larger boxes and stack them on the pallets. The work was dull and repetitive, but I got along with everyone, and the Haitian women would playfully tease me about being the only white guy. But the chemicals at the factory made me smell really, really bad. After a couple days, the family I was living with asked me to leave, so I started sleeping under a tree in a secluded area of Central Park. This was during the 2004 Republican National Convention, and the city was packed with people. After my shift at the factory, I would walk around recording protesters. There was an energy to all of it that I found thrilling, and I decided this was the ideal tape to use for my first story. This system must be overthrown, or absolutely nothing fundamental will change. I had this grand vision of a story about the factory and the protesters of my whole life, and it kept growing with everything new that I saw and heard. It was like some big, fat, sprawling Proust novel. I knew it was all connected in some way. I just wasn't sure how. The truth was, the story was a complete mess. Nearly all my tape was unusable. The mic wasn't in close enough to people's mouths. There was too much background noise. It sounded terrible. And the story itself didn't make any sense. But even though I knew the recordings I was making were useless, I couldn't stop. I only stayed in New York for a couple weeks before deciding to use the money I had saved up to leave the country and hitchhike around Europe. It seemed like going to Europe might give me the arc that the big radio story of my life needed. Plus, maybe in a foreign land, I'd muster up the courage to actually stick a microphone in people's faces. I was going with my best friend Mark. Mark and I became instant friends from the moment we met on a high school field trip. 
We were staying in a fancy hotel that wouldn't allow us to have pizza delivered, so we smuggled one into the hotel inside a suitcase and stayed up all night in our room listening to records. I was in awe of Mark's encyclopedic knowledge of music. I'd never heard of any of the bands he played for me, but I loved them all because he did. From then on, we were inseparable. Klaus? And you? Uh, my name's Mark. Uh-huh. And I'm David. You're from England? Uh, United States. I recorded all the people that picked us up in Europe. There was the French candy salesman, the Danish truck driver, a German family on their way to a birthday party for a friend of their eight-year-old son who sat next to me and tried to explain in German the rules of the video game he was playing on his Game Boy. I spent hours standing motionless so my shirt wouldn't rub up against the mic while I recorded street musicians and bands in smoky Eastern European bars. After six weeks, I was completely broke. So I had no choice but to go back to Colorado and move into my parents' basement and take a job waiting tables at a nearby Applebee's. While thumbing through the employee handbook, I discovered that my official title was Apple Buddy. That's when the depression set in. And I dealt with it by recording more and more. It was a way for me to feel like I had control over my life. As I found myself collecting all this tape, I started to read about other people who obsessively collect things. One article I read said that the deeper motivation of some collectors may be to gain greater control of a larger world that seems out of control. The article goes on to cite a passage from Philip Bloom, who wrote a book on collectors. He described collecting as a philosophical project that attempts to make sense of the multiplicity and chaos of the world, and perhaps even to find in it a hidden meaning. For me, it was like the mic was some sort of lifeline. When I was recording, I wasn't some loser living in his parents' basement working a crappy job. I was a documentarian. Except I wasn't a documentarian. I'd never even done a single interview. I had no idea how to edit tape. I didn't even own a computer. All I knew how to do was press record. Hey, so what's happening? Fine, thanks. Can I get you uh, some iced tea or some lemonade or anything to start off with? Uh, what is it, raspberry lemonade? Raspberry lemonade? Sure. Sure. My only friend at Applebee's was a meth addict named Jeremy. After work, I would go over to his apartment and drink beer and play video games while he and his friends smoked meth. One night, I was sitting on Jeremy's couch, and I noticed a tiny notebook on the coffee table. Inside, someone had drawn a series of intricate little boxes with numbers inside them and a name next to each box. Jeremy was using the notebook to keep track of his scores in Mario Golf, a video game he seemed to be playing day and night. There were pages and pages of scores, all done with the precision of someone who was very, very high. Then I came to a page with a diary entry in the same handwriting. The first line read, I need to get my life back together. Then there was a to-do list. It read, get clean, sell Jeep, use money to go to college. The last item on the list was make dad proud. I turned the page, and there, in bold, dark lines, the Mario golf scores picked up where they had left off. I felt like I was more similar to Jeremy than I wanted to admit. We'd both lost control of our lives, and instead of doing something about it, he was keeping a notebook, and I was wearing a wire. After that day, I never went back to Jeremy's, but I did keep recording. There were only a few people in my life that knew about my wire. One of them was my best friend, Mark. After we got back from our trip to Europe together, he moved to Seattle to make a record with his band, and I became an Apple buddy. Not long after I found Jeremy's notebook, I quit my job at Applebee's and moved to Seattle. One night, I was hanging out with Mark at a bar when he told me that it made him uncomfortable that I was recording him all the time. Naturally, I was recording him while he was explaining why he didn't like being recorded. It's a little hard to hear on this tape, but he says it's not that he's afraid he'll say something he will later regret. He says life is fleeting, and I say, doesn't that create a desire in you to record everything? Mark responds, I like living my life as though it's fleeting. And then he says 
that posterity is only good in certain doses. Posterity is only good in like certain doses. I was drunk during this conversation, and I didn't fully appreciate what Mark was saying, and I just went on recording him against his will. In fact, I completely forgot about this conversation until two years later when Mark passed away. After a year of living in Seattle, I moved to New Orleans, and the following summer, Mark came to visit. On his last night in town, Mark drowned in the Mississippi River. My friend Danny and I were with him when it happened. The three of us had grown up together. The day after Mark died, they put his picture on the front page of the newspaper. His body still hadn't been found, and part of me thought that maybe he was still alive, wandering the banks of the Mississippi somewhere downriver. Everywhere I went that day, I kept seeing Mark looking at me through the window of the newspaper machines, and for a split second, I would think it was him alive standing on the street corner. Whenever I think of Mark, it's that photograph of him that I picture first in my mind. It's so burned into my brain that I can't help but see that image when I think of him. It's the same way with my recordings of Mark. As I get older, my memories of him start to fade, but I keep listening to these totally unremarkable moments that suddenly have weight to them. And I'm afraid this is one of the reasons Mark didn't want me to record him in the first place. After the funeral, I told Mark's family that I would gather up all my recordings of him, and for the first time, I started listening to a lot of the tape I had of Mark. Going through hundreds of hours of recordings, I understand now what Mark meant when he said that posterity is only good in small doses. At times, this compulsion to go through all my tape and catalog it makes me feel like a character in some fable about the perils of holding on to the past, where my punishment is that I am forced to relive hours upon hours of my own boring life. What's in the crab rangoon? Like this recording of Mark and I ordering food in a Chinese restaurant. If I get something small, can you spot me? Yeah. All right, I'm going to get a small hot and sour soup and then... Um, and then onion rings. I know that sounds weird, but that's what okay. we're I know that it's moments like this one that Mark would not want to be remembered by. If he got to pick which of his recordings would make up his legacy, I'm not sure which ones he would choose. Maybe a song from the last record he made with his band. Maybe an episode from his college radio show. He would want it to be something he was proud of. Definitely not the time he ordered onion rings in a Chinese restaurant. But at the same time, if all that existed of Mark on tape were the moments he chose, there would be something missing. I keep returning to these unremarkable moments precisely because I get to experience Mark the way he would be if we were just hanging out, which is what I miss most about our friendship. To this day, I haven't listened to all the tape I have, but slowly I'm going through it, and every once in a while, I come across a recording of Mark that I've never heard before. And like, I was, and it's like I he's was, there, uh, in the room with me, just sitting was, and talking about nothing special. And in those moments... The recordings don't feel like such a failure after all. <laughs> For one thing I forgot to tell you about when we were busking, like we bought this sweatshirt the night before, like at this place in like Georgia, it was outside on the bargain yeah. rack for like five dollars. And it said, Home Alone with a monster. Of like this claw going around this door, like about to open, and, like we wore it to the Polish party. Yeah. Over to That was a song called Altitude 
by Mark's band, Masks Phantom. On Wiretap today, you heard a story written and produced by David Weinberg. You can hear more of David's radio work at randomtape.com. Thanks today to Roman Mars. Wiretap is produced by Mira Bertwintonic, Crystal Duhame, and me, Jonathan Goldstein. Tune into Wiretap Saturdays at 3.30 and Thursday evenings at 11.30. You can also hear Wiretap across North America on Sirius Satellite Radio 159. Or subscribe to the podcast at cbc.ca slash wiretap, where you can also learn how to submit your very own Wiretap theme song, just like the one you heard at the beginning of the show by Vancouver listener Nathan Mose. And while you're at the website, be sure to download the latest Wiretap ringtone. And bam! There's the bolt of line, quarter inch. And it would go pow! And we're like, whoa, no way! Be reminded that the world is magic with every ring of your phone. Looking for more CBC Podcasts? Go to cbc.ca slash podcasting.